In the 1970s, emerging from the European lands of Ireland and Scotland comes Celtic rock, a fusion of traditional Irish, Scottish Gaelic, and Breton music with modern rock. It is most commonly created by playing traditional Irish jigs, reels, and hornpipes, while combining traditional instruments, such as the tin whistle, Celtic harp, fiddle, bolan, melodeon, bagpipes, and much more, to the formatting of conventional rock songs, usually in terms of rhythms and electric aspects. Certain artists sometimes add Celtic dialects as well. Dating as far back as the 1100s in mainly Ireland and Scotland, music has been a prominent component of Celtic culture. Along with the music came Celtic dance, which by some would be considered part of the music because they were such closely knit art forms at the time. People would play music and dance at weddings, at Cayleys, on holidays, and at any party. Traditional Irish music consisted of the jig and 6-8 time, the reel and 4-4, four, four, and hornpipes, which were actually from England in 4-4 four, four time. The music in Scotland happened to be similar due to the heavy influences Ireland and Scotland had on each other, both being under English rule. The Scottish were known for the bagpipes, that were originally meant to be used as tools to trick opposing armies in war into thinking their army was bigger than it actually was. These styles of music developed to help define a cultural identity for Ireland and Scotland along with the other British Isles. However, during the 1600s, British labeled the Irish as barbarians, thus attempting to override their supposed unruly culture by giving land in Ireland to English Protestants. Instead of resulting in cultural fusion, it resulted in oppression of all Irish culture. As the 1700s and 1800s passed, more and more of the Irish's rights were stripped away, including traditional Irish music and dance. Despite the centuries of oppression, their songs have managed to live on through sly attempts at avoiding persecution by the church and keeping tradition alive in the backcountry. After the annulment of the Irish Dance Halls Act of 1934, a cultural revival was soon evident, along with the return of traditional Celtic styles from not only Ireland but also throughout Scotland, Wales, and Brittany, came new genres heavily influenced by mainstream music of the time, especially during the 1970s. This was when the electric folk scene began in England, resulting in an attempt in Ireland to fuse it with their own cultural context. This created Celtic rock. Musicians within the Gaelic cultures of this time would write songs derived from Celtic mythology along with deep cultural wounds such as the Potato Famine and the Northern Irish Conflict, which both helped shape Irish identity today. The first group to have the term Celtic rock applied to them was the Horse Lips. They were founded in Dublin, Ireland in 1970, playing traditional Irish reels and jigs with rock undertones. They were known as the Fathers of Celtic Rock, but weren't fully recognized until the 1990s. They began with Barry Devlin, Eamon Carr, and Charles O'Connor and were cajoled into pretending to be a band for a beer commercial but needed a keyboard player, so they got Jim Lockhart. They enjoyed the performance so much, they decided to do things right and became professional on St. Patrick's Day, 1972. Turning cultural heads, they had found a way to be both Irish and modern. They tapped into the glamour of rock and at the same time the native tradition. Along with the horse lips came Thin Lizzy, an Irish hard rock band forming in Dublin, Ireland in 1969. What was unique about this band was that it took members from not only Northern and Southern Ireland, but from both Catholic and Protestant communities. And although it contained influences of psychedelic rock and country, it was generally considered to be hard rock. The band members had strong influences of artists such as Bob Dylan, Bruce Springsteen, Van Morrison, and all of Irish literary tradition. Most of their early shows were heavy rock with little noticeable Celtic elements. However, in the 1972, their song Whiskey in the Jar, a rock and roll twist on a traditional tune, hit the top of the charts. This opened up their music to a larger audience, but in turn, put the rest of their music in its shadow. This was the first time a literal reinventing of a traditional tune occurred, and it set the stage for many bands of the future. Over in Scotland, one of the leading bands of the Celtic rock genre was the JSD band. It consisted of members Jim Divers, Sean O'Rourke, and Des Cofield, from which their band name was derived. Playing and winning the Scottish Folk Group Championships in Edinburgh for their lively electric rock approach to traditional Scottish folk music allowed them to make their start and become noticed. 
They combined not only Irish, but also Scottish music and gathered Scottish and Irish personnel to form Five Hand Reel. They toured through Europe and North America, spreading the Celtic rock genre. However, many say the band did not live up to its potential due to musical differences, commercial pressures, and family obligations. The band broke up in July of 1974. These bands cleared a pathway for many bands to come. The genre spawned many success stories such as U2 and The Pogues, both of whom achieved international attention. Some modern bands made use of Celtic music in a new context. Others swang away from it, allowing them to have a mainstream yet still distinctive sound. In Gaelic communities, Celtic rock is less mainstream oriented, but is used as a device to promote Celtic identity, especially in areas where the Celts are a minority. This reinforces the pan-Celtic cultures and allows for people of similar heritage to come together from widely dispersed areas. Perhaps the most significant consequence of Celtic rock is the generation of cultural and musical creativity all around the world and the revival of a once-dying culture.